So we move to the Philippines. Um, just um, to clarify um, where we are and what we are searching for. So just a, re a quick reminder. Um, the first art of Africa is supposedly to um, have happened sometime about uh, 1.8 million years ago. At least we have some evidences, uh, fossil remains, human fossil remains, uh, as well as some uh, stone tools and uh, um, animal bones with uh, cutting marks, butchery marks, um, dating back to 1.8 million years ago in uh, Georgia, in the site of uh, the Manisi. This was made supposedly by uh, either, depending on uh, scholars, to by uh, Homo georgicus or Homo erectus, um, but that's equal. Nevertheless, we do have some um, older evidences in China, where we do have some stone tools, potentially dating back to 2.1 million years ago. Uh, this is what you have uh, here in a loose formation, so a succession of uh, the whitish layers are deposited by wind and the reddish layers are formation of vegetation, so uh, fossil soils. And in these layers, you do find some uh, uh, crude flakes, just like these ones, and they are supposed to be um, dating back to 2.1 million years ago. Nevertheless, the paleoanthropological evidences uh, dating back to the lower Pleistocene in China are um, not that numerous, and at least in terms of dating, they are quite debated. Uh, we do have, uh, in fact, quite clear uh, human remains, at least dating back to uh, 800,000 years ago, a bit younger actually. In uh, Shukutian, with these uh, uh, historical sites, um, historical sites in the field of prehistory, meaning that it was uh, discovered and excavated in the early 20th century, uh, where you do have the potentially same species that you, that you have in Georgia, that is Homo erectus. That species that you also find in Indonesia, in the historical site as well of Trinil, also um, dating dated back to um, a, 800,000 years um, ago, you have a picture of this site here of the excavation in uh, the uh, late um, 19th century in the uh, 1890s. This is the site nowadays. It's not exactly the same viewpoint. The site that was excavated is here, as you, as you can see. Wait, I'll try something. That way. So that's the site here the remaining site, at least, that was excavated. So, um, a skull cap was found, but also several animal remains. Here, uh, you see uh, some of those, so uh, hundreds of animal remains found back then. Skull cap of a Homo erectus, a femur, and uh, a molar. Actually, there are more femurs. Uh, some of them are debated, but um, I see no problem to attribute them to Homo erectus as well, but it has been discussed. Anyway, you do have Homo erectus in um, Indonesia. Actually, that's the very first one that was described, and that's where the, the name Homo erectus was, uh, came from by Eugène Dubois in uh, 1891. And here you have the creation of, back then it was not Homo, but Pithecanthropus erectus. Now we call it Homo erectus. It took about one century until uh, the 1990s uh, to find the stone tools of those Homo erectus in Indonesia. So we had nice um, human remains, uh, not only from Trinil, but also from the, the Sangaran uh, sites, because you have several localities on Sangaran. And this is one of the localities where, for the first time, were found together Homo erectus uh, remains. Here you have a molar. You have a tool here made out of uh, stegodon tusk. So stegodon is, uh, is from the family of uh, elephants, uh, as well as uh, some animal bones with some cutting marks. Here you have a cutting marks um, observed under an electronic microscope. So century to know more about those uh, first islanders in the humanity because um, those homologies were on the island of Java.
So this means that we know still little about those homologies. What we discovered quite lately in the early uh, 21st century is that those homorities potentially made out to um, true islands, meaning islands that were always islands. Um, the island of Java has been connected um, back and back um, uh, during the whole Quaternary uh, era due to um, uh, glacial periods with uh, sea level drop uh, up to 120 uh, meters lower than the present day. But some of the island in, uh, islands in Southeast Asia were never connected to uh, mainland Southeast Asia for the simple reason that um, the trenches between uh, the marine trenches between uh, uh, those islands and the other ones, the next ones, were too deep and therefore uh, a sea level drop of 120 meters was not enough to connect to those islands. And what we found on those two islands were dwarf hominins. Here you have one of them on uh, the, the island of Luzon in the Philippines, in the site of Calao Cave, that's Homo luzonensis from the island of Luzon. Here you have some of the teeth found there, but um, some other remains were found, including a femur and some uh, finger bones. And here's the one that uh, was found on the island of Flores, that is part of Indonesia, with the species named Homo floresiensis. Um, this Homo luzonensis is the oldest um, human remain so far in the Philippines, and it's dated at the moment to um, 67,000 years. So 67,000 years, that was the uh, earliest site in the Philippines before we started uh, our work. In Flores, we are about the same time period, around uh, 80,000 years ago, with this Homo floresiensis from the cave of Liangbur. But on the island of Flores, we also know that was discovered later in 2016, human remains that look very much like this Homo floresiensis, although it was not named Homo floresiensis, it's also a dwarf hominin, small size, and this was dated to 700,000 years ago, and we also have still in the area of Matamenge, where this human remain was found, but in another locality, older, dating back to one million years ago, stone tools by thousands. So several stone tools evidencing that hominins arrived on the island of Flores at least one million years ago, and by 700,000 years ago, it was already reduced in size and prefigurating, announcing what was, uh, what would be called uh, Homo uh, Frosensis. Dwarfing on islands is very common. Here you have an example of uh, normal size or at least present day size of uh, elephants. And here a dwarf elephas from one of those islands. That is something very common that was documenting in the past. Here you have two fossils, but we do have uh, examples of uh, species that change in size in island environments. Here you have a giant rat from uh, the Philippines that still lives nowadays. When I say giant, I say really big size, huh? size of a big cat. That's a rat. And you do have also uh, uh, an example that you all know that is the um, Komodo dragon, that is a giant lizard. So the rule is quite simple. The smallest become large on islands and the largest become small on islands. The purpose of this course is um, to talk about excavation. So I won't describe uh, the process behind this dwarfing and gigantism on islands. But if we have time for questions, you can ask that uh, later and I will be glad to answer to you. So. Southeast Asia, 800,000 years ago. Here, what I mentioned to you, the sea level dropped by 120 meters. That was the condition 800,000 years ago in islands of East Asia. Some of those islands were not islands anymore. And therefore, those Homo erectus on Java Island could have arrived just by walking. But some of those islands were really islands back then. And therefore, they had to cross some sea straits. So we do have remains on Flores, and um, we know that they arrived quite early, about one million years ago. They reduced in size quite quickly 
and uh, gave birth to this uh, hominin that we call Homo floresiensis. Something quite similar happened on the Philippines, on the island of Luzon, with the Callao Cave hominin that we call Homo luzonensis. And therefore, when we started, the question was, um, do we have exactly the same scenario that uh, we uh, observed on Flores on Luzon Island? Meaning that, do we have an early arrival of Homo erectus or one of its kin back to 800 or even 1 million years ago? And that slowly reduced in size to give birth to this Homo luzonensis. So that is the theoretical theoretical framework. So that was the uh, research questions. We are in the island of Flores. We have this 67 uh, uh, southern years old uh, Calocet dwarf hominin named Homo luzonensis. And the question is, when did it arrive? Who was its ancestor? Was it an early arrival dating back to the boundary between the lower and middle Pleistocene? So to search for um, to answer to this question, we had to find sediments dating back to 800 or even 1 million years ago, and sediments that would have preserved some fossils. We do have some sediments that have been documented in the past in the geological history of the research in the Philippines, dating back to that period. We are uh, in 1930s. This is Lawrence Wilson, he's a mining geologist, and he reports dating back to uh, uh, 1935, some uh, large uh, mammals found not far from Kaloike, actually, on the other side of the main river flowing there, that is the Kaguyan River. Uh, the Kaloike is on the right bank of this Kaloike uh, River, and uh, he found fossils on the left bank of the uh, Kaloike River. These are the archives of Lawrence Wilson, and you see that Kaloike River. The lower cave is about there, and you see that is pointing to rhino bones that were found uh, on the western bank, uh, on the uh, left bank of this Kayan River. He, they were discovered by a school teacher back then, and he uh, uh, organized uh, and funded an expedition to uh, try to uh, localize um, those rhino fossils. He did not succeed to do so, but the area became famous and more fossils were found and were then described by this um, guy. This is uh, Hal von Königswald. He is famous for many um, fossils he discovered in Java, including Homo erectus fossils, and is the one who described in two papers fossil mammals. Here's your, here you have a tooth of a rhino, and also uh, stone tools he found in the Cayenne area. Um, where the rhino fossils were supposed to come, but all that on surface just by surveying. And he was invited to study those fossils and to, um, um, and that led him to discover these uh, stone tools by Otley Bayer, that was uh, the archaeologist in the Philippines back then in the 1950s. This is the area we are on the left side of the Cayenne River, Calo Cave is there. This is the area, and the National Museum of the Philippines excavated several localities starting back in the 1970s. This is one of the excavation here on the left side, where uh, you have the stratigraphy here, and you see that they did find some elephant fossils here in one layer, and they did find some flake tools also in a layer. Problem is that uh, the flakes were in a layer higher than the elephant fossil layer, and therefore they could not demonstrate back then in the 1970s that humans were present in the Philippines by the same time with these elephants, knowing that these elephants are now extinct in the Philippines. So more endeavor uh, have been uh, organized by, still by the National Museum of the Philippines in collaboration with uh, foreign institutions, including uh, the Erasmus program you are enrolled in. This is an excavation by Clyde uh, Jagon and uh, uh, Julie was uh, teaching to you um, 
last night has been part of this excavation in uh, 2007. But also, unfortunately, they did not manage to prove uh, the uh, antiquity of man in the Philippines. Another attempt in 2001, a bit earlier, by uh, two paleontologists, uh, John De Rose from the Netherlands and Angel Batista from the Philippines. And they did find some stone tools and fossils. These are um, the squares and the triangles here, but problem. This was in the topsoil, so in the present day soil, and therefore the um, sedimentary conditions have been disturbed and uh, the antiquity could not be proven uh, still. That was the uh, context when we uh, arrived in 2014 and when we organized a survey, meaning that we walked all over those uh, rolling knolls, those small um, hills there, with uh, um, a GPS, um, collecting everything we could find on surface, taking the coordinates just to understand um, if uh, antiquity could be searched, antiquity of man could be searched in this area. So this is one of the fossils we collected on surface. We collected many others. I'm just showing it um, because it's uh, a new species that we discovered on surface, so out of context, but still a new species, Celeborchiaeus caryonensis. Um, this is a pig, and this is the tusk of a pig. And I will mention about this pig again um, at the end of this uh, course, so keep that in mind, Celeborchiaeus caryonensis. We also find several tectites on surface. Tectites, these are uh, the byproducts of uh, uh, meteor impact that happened um, sometime um, around 800,000 years ago, an impact that uh, um, uh, was localized in southern China, most likely. And uh, these are the byproducts of this uh, meteor impact. So they are not meteors, they are just byproducts, and we find many of them on surface. Because we had many of them on surface, one, it meant that most of the sediments were probably younger than this impact 800,000 years ago. And maybe because we had many of them, we were not that uh, younger than uh, 800,000 years ago. So after this survey, we were quite confident that we were on the good track, at least the good spot, to search for this antiquity of money in the Philippines. So we mapped everything, uh, um, animal remains, the stone tools, the tectites, and we uh, realized that everything was in a small uh, concentrated area, meaning that uh, although everything was surface, the stone tools were always uh, um, next to um, uh, fossil faunas that are uh, belonging to extinct species now. Um, so therefore, the uh, accumulation on surface and the uh, uh, mixing on surface was potentially old. And that's why we decided to excavate in uh, 2014. So, Kalao Cave, the Kalao River, the Kagan River, sorry, and the um, Kalinga site. That's the name of the site. This is one, here you have two of the small hills, just like I've shown you before. Here are some of the hills. There are two of the small hills. We opened two trenches for stratigraphic control along those two hills. And at the bottom of one of those hills, we uh, opened uh, an excavation square. Here is the stratigraphic profile. Should uh, show it on the other side, on the other way, so from bottom to top. And uh, we have a succession of layers that uh, we uh, organized into uh, four main units. So unit A, F, G and H. These are those units, and I will describe them to you uh, quite later. This is the unit of interest. You show, you see this uh, reddish bone here. That is the unit of interest. This is the trench, the other trench, and the excavation square there when we opened it, and then we uh, enlarged the area. What we found: tectite in a layer. A clay layer. In the same layer, we found uh, bones, and we found here, you don't see it very well, but I will show you it better. We find also a um, stone tool. 
bone. This is a vertebra, a rib, uh, sorry, a rib, not a vertebra, a rib of a rhino. Here you have a flake, and here you have a core. Here you have, in the same layer, a flake next to the femur of a rhino. So we did find the antiquity of man, at least um, that's what we thought when we excavated. Here are the, some of the stone tools we found. We didn't find much stone tools, less than, than 100. Most of them are small dimension, a few are a bit larger. We did find some pebbles that might have been used as hammer stones, not sure. Hammer stone is there to break, uh, to produce some, uh, some flakes or uh, maybe for butchery that we don't know. And um, some cores as well. And uh, it looks like those cores were produced by a napping on anvil, so a bipolar percussion. So you nap, and the energy propagates into um, all through um, the pebble until the uh, anvil that is placed below, and the energy bounces back, and that allows you to remove a flake from this poor quality raw material. We did find some um, fossil remains. Here you have plastron of box turtle. That's the fossil compared to uh, reference collection. Same here. We do have monitor lizard, so small size lizard compared to uh, reference uh, one. We do have um, also fibula of monitor lizard. We do have deer through uh, molars, several molars, a set of molars from the same one individual. And we do have a uh, stegonon molar. Um, that's not much. Here I'm showing you all the fauna we found, or well, at least almost all the fauna, because what we found also is an almost complete uh, remains, um, carcass of uh, rhinoceros. Here you have the long bones we found, and we have most of uh, the rhino that is preserved here. Here's one of the molar of the rhino. It is worn out. It could be more worn out. So it is an adult, clearly. Uh, it is a grown adult, um, not uh, an old adult. Just to say that. Um, um, we do not know based on that if it died from age or uh, for other reasons, for not from natural reasons or not. This is the rhino, several bones that we excavated with uh, bamboo sticks that we made on the site. So no trowels. We made bamboo sticks from local bamboo, and we excavated with that just to prevent to damage the bones and to create newly made cut marks that would erase potentially prehistoric cut marks. And um, we were correct to do so because uh, next to the stone tools and cores, we found here you have a rib still embedded in the sediments. And on that rib, you have here two cutting marks. We found more of those cutting marks still on the rib here, a nice cutting mark, Th several three cutting marks here on um, a metatarsal of this rhino. And we have uh, much more. Um, we have also percussion marks here. Here you have some other cut marks on this rib here, quite complete rib. And we do have percussion mark here on one humerus, so arm uh, bone, and uh, that succeeded to break the this humerus. And here, uh, also a percussion mark on the other mirrors, but in this case, they did not succeed to break the bones. It, just you have to consider that uh, bones of rhinos are very thick, and therefore, considering the poor quality of the raw material there on the site, it's not fully surprising that they did not succeed to break that bones. What is interesting is that they tried once, not twice. So it looks like they had enough food, and they didn't need to uh, break this one. They had enough, uh, collected enough uh, to sustain. So percussion marks on rhino, but also some interesting uh, taphonomic patterns. Uh, this is uh, the female, one of the females of the rhino. We found the two females, one of the females of um, this rhino. Um, 
and you have some uh, trampling marks just compared to a myosin rhino, so a rhino from Europe by a time when hominins uh, were not around 40 million years ago and the same pattern. So this is evidence that this is all natural due by trampling. We do have knowing marks, so rodents were there, although we didn't find rodents. Therefore, we conducted some analysis, first dating. Um, Christian had several questions from the students about um, dating. So here are the dating methods we applied on the site. Um, first one is argon-argon method. We do have uh, sandy layers. This is the bone bed where the rhino and the stone tools were found. The layer F here, that is clay, that clay here. Below this clay, you have uh, sand. And above this clay, you do have sand as well. So we could uh, sample this sand and analyze uh, the uh, volcanic minor roles for argon-argon dating. We dated the underlying layer to the fossil, uh, to the bone bed, and the upper laying layer. The underlying layer gave an argon-argon age of one million year, and the upper layer of one million year as well. Same age. What does that mean? It means that one million years ago, you had a volcanic eruption. Uh, argon argon dating is um, providing an age for a volcanic eruption, not a deposit. So you might have had a volcanic eruption one million years ago, and then those volcanic minerals have been transported by rivers or so for uh, thousands of years. And therefore, the site may, may be much younger. What is true is that the, the site cannot be older than one million years. So that is just an indication. And therefore, we applied other methods. Paleomagnetism, because we have a silt layer here in, in uh, interbedded between the uh, sandy layers, and that gave a normal polarity. Remember, we found a tectite with the bones. Tectite, I told you, that uh, indicates a meteor impact, a meteor impact that happened in, somewhere in China 800,000 years ago, so we knew that the bone bed could not be older than 800,000 years ago, the we would not have found any tectite. And therefore, this normal polarity is um, fully coherent with that. Um, after 800,000 years ago, uh, the uh, polarity is uh, normal, so the magnetic north is uh, uh, aligned with the uh, geographic north. So that makes fully sense. And we applied another a third method that is electrospine resonance, electro spin resonance on the same layers where the argon argon was used on the quartz from the sand from that layers on the underlying layer and upper lying layer on the underlying layer we get an age of 727,000 years and the upper lying layer an age of 700,000 years plus minus 70,000 years the error margin is quite large because we're on an old site and exospin resonance is a parametric method. So error is always quite large for such old sites. But at least in this case, we dated the deposits because this method dates the uh, covering of the minerals, in this case quartz, by uh, sediments from the uh, lights uh, of the sun. And therefore here we dated um, the deposits. And we also apply the methods on, because the semi curve can be also applied on uh, bones and teeth, preferably on teeth and bones, and on one of the uh, rhino teeth, and we got an age of 709,000 years. So layer A, or unit A, is 727,000 years based on ESR, this method. The bone bed is 709,000 years based on the same method, another material, that is tooth. And the upper laying layer is 701,000 years. This is fully current from uh, bottom to top, is older to younger. None of those ages are older than the tectite. None of those ages are older than the positive uh, paleomagnetic polarity. And none of these uh, ages are older than the argon argon uh, age that dated the volcanic eruption one million years ago. So those three methods are fully current, and therefore we are pretty confident that the bone bed deposited sometime around 709,000 years ago.
and therefore we had the oldest site in the Philippines. So we found what we were looking for. Did we? But we have to be sure that um, although they are found in the same layer, those stone tools and those bones are really uh, the same age. We are an open site and uh, many things could have happened since um, 700,000 years, several perturbations, and we have to make it clear. So first is to look at the context and look at the sediments. We look at the quartz. Uh, Christian presented uh, the method to you, so that's the same. We look at the quartz under uh, electronic microscope, scanning electronic microscope, uh, SEM, and uh, you can make the difference between quartz uh, that have been transported by wind and quartz transported by rivers. And here you have different patterns of modification on the surface of the quartz, of erosion of those quartz due to transport either by wind or river. And it happened that half of the quartz on the site were transported by wind and therefore were certainly primary deposit from a volcanic eruption. And half of the quartz were, quartzes were transported by rivers, were rounded by uh, uh, water and therefore uh, had a much longer history. I'll come back on that. We also look at the composition of uh, the sediments through X-ray diffraction on the powdered sediment. And what we found is that we have several types of, um, of uh, minerals including saponite, nontronite, and these are pointing to a volcanic environment. And not only volcanic environment, but ashes, volcanic ashes that have uh, been deteriorated after the deposition. We knew we were in a volcanic environment. The Philippines is volcanic, but at least here we have evidence of a volcanic eruption that is certainly part of the formation of this archaeological site. I will come back on this. Therefore, we have several analyses, several results from different analyses, and now we want to make it uh, all together to understand what happened 700,000 years ago, and if humans were um, in the Philippines by the time rhinos that are now extinct in the Philippines were roaming around. So, that's the excavation area. That's my colleague in the Philippines. Here you will find a, a layer um, that is uh, the contact layer between uh, the clay where we found the fossils. This is the clay and excavated and at the bottom. You have the sand, the sand that is uh, this uh, unit here. Okay. So that's the topographic surface of the excavation. Here you find some of the rimmers, uh, pebbles, but also some bones. Here you have a bone. Here you have another bone, but you have several pebbles here. And here the topography we have. You can see from here that you have uh, something that is deep in here. It is um, deeper than uh, the rest of the excavation. And that's indeed the topography you have, this deeper part and uh, those two more elevated sides. It looks like this deep, deep part, uh, you can follow it. What does that mean? Certainly that you had a stream flowing there. And that's the surface of that stream, the same stream that deposited the sand here. And on top of that, you have uh, the clay, the clay that contains the, uh, the ashes. And within this clay, the contact with the sand, you do find the uh, rhino, the deer, the stegodon, the monitor lizard, the stone tools, the cores, the flakes, etc., etc., and the tectites. Let's look at it. You have your stream there and you have your uh, bones. The question is, were the bones of the rhino transported by this small stream, this paleo stream, and therefore were the stone tools also transported by this paleo stream, and therefore 
are their association original? Are they really the same age? Are the stone tools we found the one used for butchering the rain? That's the stream bed. Here are some of the ribs we found in connection. These are those ribs here, still, still attached in connection. This means that the flesh was not removed before their uh, deposition. But what is clear is that most of the bones have a main orientation and that this orientation follows the orientation of the, the stream bed. So you could suspect that those bones were transported by the, the uh, stream bed. And when they were transported, some at least still had some flesh on it, so were not butchered yet by uh, hominids. Some broke here, that's uh, this part of the excavation. This bone here is this bone, and here you have the rib on top of it that is broken. And therefore, here you can easily see that the rib deposited and under the pressure of the sediment, after some years, maybe 100 years, maybe 1,000 years, we don't know, the rib broke inside the sediment. But some ribs were already broken before the transport. This is this part of the excavation. You see three fragments of one single rib. This part refits with this one, this part with this one. This is one rib. The three pieces were broken before the transport or during the transport and the different uh, segments move toward each other during the transport and their deposition, but not far from each other. And not far from each other mean that certainly the transport was not far away. Same example, uh, so different example, but same case. Here we are here. This long rib is this one. And you see those three fragments belong to the same rib and they shifted toward each other, those three fragments, three segments. They belong to one rib that broke during the transport or before the transport and that uh, moved and shifted toward each other. But again, that's an indication that the transport was not long. The distance from the butchery place until this stream bed was not uh, long. It was a short distance. And we also find in this part of the excavation that is not represented here, several small fragments like this one, like this one, like this one, like this one. Small triangular sharp edges fragments of ribs of rhinos. And evidently these were broken before the deposition and even before the transport. And most likely these were broken by human hand and transported as such. And because we find them in this part of the excavation, these are the smallest pieces, the largest one are here. Potentially, you had a transport that was in toward this direction. What was the cause of that transport? Well, maybe the stream or maybe uh, something else. Let's look at it. You have the stream that we reconstructed here. So we had the topography. So we uh, used models to uh, uh, drop water on it, pour water on that topographic model, this uh, 3D surface, and see how the water would uh, run on that surface. And here's the water running here and accumulating in the deepest parts, the stream beds. You have one and you have another one uh, also in the area. These are two stream beds and they are independent from each other. Here you have the contour of the smallest one here in orange, and here the contour of the other one here in uh, green. We uh, projected on this surface um, the bones, uh, the stone tools, etc. And what happened is um, that we used cluster analysis to try to uh, see if uh, the remains would mainly concentrate in the bottom of the stream beds and therefore be the result of a process of transport and deposition by this uh, paleo stream. Theoretically, if that was the case, then we would find two clusters, one from this stream and one for this stream. This is not the case. We found clusters that are related to the depth of the area 
and nothing with the uh, paleo streams. What does that mean? That means that certainly those paleo streams are not responsible for the transport. Other demonstration here, that's the main direction of this main stream. Here, that's the main direction of the elongated bones. And you see that those two direction lines are clearly different. Now, if you consider that here you have a curve, a turn in this stream, we can also compute another uh, uh, direction line and see that this one also differs from the main orientation of the bones. So if the bones were transported by the stream, they would tend to be either oriented in the same direction with the stream, which is not the case here, or perpendicularly with the stream transversally, which is not the case here neither, except for some small parts. So therefore, from this, we can conclude that the stream is not responsible for the transport and deposition of the rhino bones. But those remains, those bones, accumulated in the bottom of the stream bed for the simple reason that they were the deepest part. And most certainly they, come, they came from there and got stuck in the sand here along these streams. Main orientation of the bones, we see that there is a preferred orientation that is in two dimensions. If you do that in three dimensions, so that's the same graph as here, you see that most of the points, you have a concentration in red density are here, north, west, south, east, just like here. And most of the points are, points are at the periphery of this graph. And if you look at here, the center of the graph is 90 degrees, so meaning something that is vertical a bone that will be ventricle, and at the periphery, it's zero degrees, so that means the bones that deposited flat. And therefore, this main orientation is not related to the slope of this topographic area of the stream. If you look at the dispersion of the pebbles and the stone tools, the stone tools are in red here, you find the same main orientation in terms of density, but this is uh, the curve of the position, the mean curve of the position of those stone tools. This is the one for the pebbles. And you see that those curves differ. And what you observe is that, in fact, what you have is that most of the stone tools are found in the periphery of the bones that are in the middle here. So let's summarize. You had, some time ago, a meteorite impact somewhere in China with byproducts that are textiles and that uh, you find in the area. The site was formed soon after this meteorite, meteorite impact, but this meteorite impact has no relation at all with the formation. Then, some time happened, a rhino died, we do have cutting marks, so we know it was um, butchered by hominids, but we don't know if hominids killed it. All we can say is that the rhino was not that old, but it could have died for natural uh, reasons. It was butchered. We do have uh, cutting marks, and once they remove the flesh, we do have percussion marks, so they try to break the bones. Then, you did have a volcanic eruption because we did find some ashes in the clay surrounding the rhino. This volcanic eruption certainly destroyed the landscape. What is common after a volcanic eruption is that the atmospheric pressure gets higher and then it rains. It certainly rain and then you add a mud flow. So uh, the soil uh, moved and because there was no more vegetation, uh, this uh, soil on which the uh, rhino was lying uh, was set in movements. So the rhino was transported, certainly with the stone tools, and deposited in a stream that was uh, 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 a deep part where the, all that material 
could get stuck. So the main orientation of the bones of the rhino we found is due to uh, transport and certainly due to a mud flow consecutive to a volcanic eruption. And certainly the stone tools found along with the rhino are the same age with the rhino and are the one responsible for the butchery of the rhino. What we are sure at least, because the rhino is complete, is that the site did not, uh, was not um, modified, perturbated after the deposit of this rhino in the stream. It's that um, if the stone tools are not the same age with the rhino, the stone tools are older than the rhino. They cannot be younger because uh, once the rhino was buried, nothing happened. Otherwise, the rhino would not be complete and otherwise the smallest fragment, the tiniest fragments of the rhino would not be found along with the larger ones. Am I clear? Well, if I'm not clear, you will have some questions. So, 700,000 years ago, we have in the Philippines, a quite poor fauna, stegodon, cervid, a deer, turtle, lizard, we have a pig, and we have uh, this rhino. By the same time, on Java, you have Homo erectus, and by the same time, on Flores, you have hominin that mimics, that looks like Homo floresiensis. Here you are on an island that was connected to mainland Southeast Asia due to a sea level drop. Here you are on islands that were always islands. And therefore, that's the reason for this impoverished fauna. Not all the animals could make it to the island. So, analysis, then comes publication. We, we publish that and we disseminate that. So, Every year when we excavate, we will come pupils on the site, we explain them, we work with the local populations, we explain them as well, what we do and how we do, and uh, why we do that. This is a worldwide heritage, but this is also their own heritage, this is their land where they work, and uh, therefore that's why we um, explain them what we are doing. And they work with us all the day, and when we are not there, they uh, continue to uh, check the site for us because they understand what we are doing. So we go to uh, schools, we teach to, to uh, pupils, we welcome them on the site, and then we exhibit what we found in museums. This is in the National Museum, but we also have a local museum where part of the collection are exhibited. These are the true uh, fossils. They are not cast, they are the true fossils that are exhibited to everyone in the Philippines so they can see what was found. Now, this is how the excavation went. And once we have excavated, we answered some of the questions we were wondering at the early stage of this research, but we do have more questions. This is the condition of Southeast Asia 700,000 years ago. Islands that have always been islands. Here we have now butchery sites. Contemporaneous with Homo erectus in Indonesia. Remember, I told you that in Indonesia, we had to wait for 100 years until the 1990s to find the first stone tools of Homo erectus. This is the site of Nemo. I told you that in that site, you also have some butchery marks. So here you have butchery marks. Here in Kalinga, the site we excavate in the Philippines, we do have butchery marks. We do not know the hominin, but we do have butchery marks. And the site I've shown you in China named Sukutian, dating back to 800,000 years ago, 750,000 years ago, you also have butchery marks. These are the only three sites in Asia for this lower middle Pleistocene period where you do have butchering activities. In other terms, we know still very little about the behavior of uh, Homo erectus or the king. Therefore, the question is, knowing we know so little about Homo erectus or the king, um, how can we make, build hypotheses about the way they managed to reach those islands that have always been islands? 
And these are new questions raising from our research. We know that for large mammals, it's quite easy. They do swim very well. They have a big stomach, they can float, and therefore swim on long distance. This is not the case of carnivores, but uh, herbivores can swim very well. This is the case of uh, elephants. This is the case of rhino. You all have in mind, when I mentioned to you about rhinos, you all have in mind, I guess, African rhino, because that's the one we always will see on pictures because they are almost extinct. Well, uh, Asian rhinos are not in better shape, but we always focus on African rhinos, but they are totally different. This is an African rhino. You have this uh, famous uh, head that is uh, dipping and uh, close to the ground for uh, constant browsing. But the Javan rhino and all the Asian rhinos, which are quite small, smaller than the African rhinos, have the head in the direction, the line made by the back. And that is very important. You soak them in water. We'll make a small experiment. We soak them in water. The African rhino would drown. The Javan rhino would survive. Um, I just precise that no animals died during this experiment. The African rhino never reached Madagascar. The Javan rhino, or at least one of its close relatives, um, reached uh, the Philippines. That's for large mammals. For small ones, we know they can, like uh, the lizard, we know they can uh, uh, cross sea barriers um, thanks to floating woods or floating islands. That's quite easy. You do have some examples of quite large islands, historical examples. Here we are in Canada, in Quebec. Here you have an island floating on the uh, main river here. I forgot the name, but whatever. And here you have, for comparison, the size of the train. You see the size of these floating islands compared to the train. You have a rich vegetation here, and you can have a quite diverse fauna. And question is, were humans part of this uh, Noah's Ark on a floating island to reach those islands that have always been islands? Where did they come from? We have a complete rhino. We are lucky. So we compared it with several other rhinos from Asia, from Southeast Asia. This is our rhino. It happened that it's also a new species and a new genus named Nesorinus. And it's very close to another species belonging to this new genus we described that is from Taiwan. And they are close to Chinese fossils. Just to put it on the map, here are the Philippines is our rhino from the newly described genus. The same genus was found on Taiwan, and those two were closely related to the one in China. Therefore, certainly you have a connection between them. The one from the Philippines came from China through Taiwan, that is Taiwan Island. What we know also, because we have Homo erectus and a rich fauna on Java, and because we know that sea level dropped by minus 120 meters 100,000 years ago, is that Homo erectus and animals potentially, most certainly, arrived to Java Island from Peninsula, Southeast Asia, by walking. So you would have two migration routes, one ending up to Java and one ending up to the Philippines. Well, not really ending up, because the main question now is which of these routes was used to reach Flores Island. And if you look at Flores Island, where you have Homo floresiensis and those stone tools dating back to one million years ago, you are exactly at the crossroad of this northern route and western route. And therefore, now the question is, who is the ancestor of Homo floresiensis? Is it Homo erectus from Java, or is it a still unknown hominid, but potentially that gave birth to Homo luzonensis? on um, Luzon Island, and beyond, in China, you have Homo erectus as well. So that is one of the questions we are trying to solve now. I mentioned to you that I will come back on this pig and this tusk of pig we found on our early survey in 2014, this tusk here from a new species, Cerebocaeus cayenensis, that belongs to a large pig with huge tusks, and this pig is unknown from the well-known fossils of Java Island. 
this being is only known from Sulawesi Island, that is that island. What does that mean? It means that the rhino arrived from China through Taiwan until the Philippines. It didn't make it to Sulawesi, but some other fossils made it to Sulawesi. That's the case of this pig. So from the Philippines to Sulawesi Island, and then to Flores Island is just one step more, just one sea strait to cross. And therefore, we are really at the center of this question. What route was taken to make it to Flores? What did this northern route or this western route? And that's what we are searching for now. Thanks.